More than two years after the COVID-19 pandemic, is the global economy at a risk of tipping into recession? Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Hello again, from London to Washington DC and many points elsewhere, high inflation rates, uh, skyrocketing energy prices and expensive housing are hurting consumers. Some analysts say if 2021 was the year of reopening, 2022 is the year of worldwide inflation. The United States and the United Kingdom, of course, are both facing record inflation, high energy prices. In comparison, China's inflation is relatively low and the government is unveiling measures to keep uh, the economy more stable this year. For more on the global economy, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Shanghai, a big friend of this show, John Gong. He's a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Good to see you again, sir. Also with us from London is Clisman Murati. He's the founder and CEO of Pareto Economics. From Sao Paulo, Gilson Schwartz, professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo. And then from all the way in Bethesda, Maryland, about three miles away, John Tamney is an editor for Real Clear Markets and Forbes magazine. John, I'm going to start with you um, because there's been a lot of focus on the US economy in the last 24 hours. There's going to be even more when the uh, uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, speaks in the Jackson Hole. But what we're seeing here seems to be um, softening construction spending, housing market, the employment picture looks good, raising rates. So is there a worry of recession? And some Republicans would argue we're already in one. I think a lot of the talk of recession is political. Uh, yeah. Depending on who's in power, they're going to say one thing or the other. Let's never forget that housing doesn't open up foreign markets, doesn't make us more productive. It doesn't lead to cancer or cures or software innovations. The notion that housing drives an economy gets it backwards. Housing is consumption. Housing is the result of a growing economy. So I think a lot of the focus of the areas of weakness in the economy over, are overdone. And, and I would just add, I think this notion of an inflationary problem right now is the stuff of redefining what inflation is. And so yeah, I, you're I, right. I Sorry to interrupt, but I want to drive this conversation forward because I grew up in the 1970s and 80s where inflation was real. I mean, if you look at the numbers now, that it's not as terrible. Uh, employment seems to have held up very well. And you seem to think that, that even though uh, everyone's freaking out, there could be a sort of what's termed a soft landing, right? That actually uh, the stimulus uh, withdrawn because of uh, the emergence from the COVID pandemic um, could actually result in a sort of more normal economy than we've seen in the last few years. Yeah, well, it's got to be stressed that this would be the first inflation in the history of mankind in which the dollar strengthened against the yen, pound, euro, and gold. Uh, to me, what's happening here is that we had lockdowns. Uh, think back to Adam Smith. One person working alone could maybe make one pin per day. Four people working together could make tens of thousands. You can't shut down a global economy and the miracle of pricing that prevailed back in February of 2020 and, and then put all those people out of work, have them go to different jobs and everything, and expect those prices to still be there two years later. Of course, prices are higher. But my stress is command and control isn't inflation. Inflation is a devaluation of the, of the unit. We just haven't seen it. Very interesting. John Gong, I'm going to go to you. Um, obviously, China is at, in a sort of different position where you've got relatively low inflation compared to here in the U.S. and definitely uh, in Europe but also a need for stimulus um, because of slowing sectors. I'm thinking of the housing sector. So is, the, uh, is Beijing and, and Washington out of whack here? Uh, and of course, there's still supply chain issues from the hangover of COVID. Yeah, well, let me first um, start with my overall assessment of the situation, the global situation. Sure. I think what we are seeing right now is very unique in history. Normally, after such an extended period of time of a you know, very uh, a powerful pandemic and almost, you know, into the third year, you know, it's going to be three years, I guess. Uh, usually there should, there should be a very powerful rebound um, in, in a sense of, uh, um, uh, in China, we describe it as like revengeful consumption. Yeah. Uh, it is Pent a substantial yeah. 
is that pe the substantial pent up demand for a lot of things. Um, and this was also, you know, historically verified by, for example, the uh, 1918, 1919 uh, Spanish flu experience. Uh, but I think what's uh, very unique in the United States is that, uh, because of two things, I think. One is that uh, this round of sort of uh, 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 government help and subsidies, you know, in terms of sending out checks um, to, to American households. Uh, uh, and that greatly stimulated the uh, supply of, uh, of money uh, in the economy. That's one thing that's sort of driving the uh, inflation. The second thing is definitely related to commodity, commodity prices that are uh, driven by the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, the oil and, and gas and, and food prices, these are very fundamental commodities in the economy, and they're driving up a lot of other, the other costs of other products uh, in the downstream industries. So, uh, so, so, you know, normally you will see a, uh, a increase of uh, a, a demand and also supply. But now, I think, uh, particularly in the United States, you have a, you know, a, a very large increase in demand, but supply side is sort of uh, suppressed because of the war in Ukraine, because of the supply chain issues. So, so I think, that, you know, this is a, a very what, what about China, John? Yeah, so for, for China, I think we don't have the, the first problem faced by the United States. That is the, uh, you know, very aggressive monetary policy during the pandemic. Uh, you know, in China, we don't see a lot of uh, sort of direct uh, checks uh, mailed to people. Um, what's happening in China right now is that uh, uh, we are sort of uh, experiencing the imported inflationary pressure. In other words, uh, the, uh, the interest rate rise in the United States, the worldwide commodity prices are resulting in a very weakened uh, uh, lo local currency. Um, and the government is sort of... Yeah, to import, the, yeah, because the dollar yeah, strength. One yeah. side wants to in increase interest rate to fight the uh, depreciation of the yuan. On the other hand, you know, it wants to stimulate the economy. But so I think right. ultimately uh, the government is sort of leaning towards the latter, I guess. Uh, so that's the current situation in China right now. <clears throat> Um, Klesman, I'm going to go to you um, uh, in London because obviously Europe uh, very much centre stage of is the global economy tipping towards a recession or is it going to be a blip, soft landing and a, and a recovery. Um, Emmanuel Macron said the other day, prepare yourself, uh, the, uh, there's a new sort of era of austerity coming. Do you feel that in Europe? The inflation crisis is worse, obviously the Ukraine uh, war is much more uh, localized, and they have also domestic issues too. I think uh, the saying winter is coming is both uh, figurative and also literal in, uh, in Europe now. And we are finding a lot of pressures happening in Europe, not only due to COVID, but also due to the war in Ukraine. And I think Europe wished that the problems of Brexit were the only things that they had to think about coming into right. 2021 and now 2022. So Europe has been put under pressure by in many different angles. Uh, be it the war in Ukraine, be it now the energy crisis, be it uh, COVID. But I think one thing that many people are focusing on, and if you really want to see the trajectories of where the problems are going to emerge even more so, is looking at illegal and legal migration patterns across Europe and across the world. And those countries where it's pe their people are leaving in droves to go to, to what they consider more established, more safer places, they're going to face the brain drain and the compounding negative impacts of that over the years. And those countries in which they're going into are going to face, again, issues uh, with uh, populism, I think, a lot more economic issues and a, a government which needs to respond uh, swiftly. But with such divergent opinions of what to do in this situation, the government is stuck in a very difficult situation as to what they should be doing moving forward, because they're going to hurt a number of different demographics right. in their countries. Um, where do you see potential spots of people doing things right in Europe? And where do you see what they're doing wrong? I mean, I, I, I've been very focused on, you know, I was originally from the UK, so I've been focused on the leadership election there, and some of the promises are quite incredible. Uh, but then you do see some pragmatic policies coming out of some of the southern European countries as well, who obviously still have that hangover from the debt crisis. I think southern European countries are facing issues in relation to even a, a, a uh, what they're hoping to be a weakening euro, which will, in, uh, will, which will incentivize UK holiday goers and holiday goers from other parts of the world to come in uh -huh. and, uh, and, and boost the uh, economy, which will drive much needed uh, foreign currency uh, to come into the country. But we're seeing that not happening as much due to the pandemic and due to other places like uh, Turkey with massive 
uh, problems in terms of inflation and devaluation of their currencies, leading more people going into there. So Europe, so Southern Europe is facing their own issues with the with migration crises, with the political uh, situation, especially in Italy and others, which is in turmoil now. Uh, so they have a lot of things internally that have existed pre-COVID uh, and pre-Brexit, if that's even a memory left in people's minds, that they were dealing with, and these have just compounded the impacts across the board. In the UK, naturally, the leadership election uh, is a is a is a is, is something which businesses are focusing on because both candidates are giving very clearly different impressions of what they want to do and what the vision for the UK would be under their leadership moving forward. But we'll see what happens in that regard, but it's still a very tense situation in yeah. Europe with no real easy way out, I don't think. Well, let's um, go to um, uh, um, Latin America now. Uh, Gilson uh, Schwartz in Sao Paulo, thank you so much for for waiting. Uh, you know, um, Brazilian elections coming up too. Uh, and, um, you know, it's amazing how governments start spending uh, when there's an election around the corner. And, and Brazil has been doing that. And even though it's had to raise rates, the employment situation looks better than, than average. And remember, you know, I was thinking the other day that Latin American countries have a have a history of inflation, but also have a lot of tools in their, in their toolbox for dealing with it and have dealt with it uh, uh, with varying degrees of success. What's the situation in Brazil right now? Well, first, uh, if I may also <laughs> uh, give my, my view on, on the present situation. Um, I think that we are uh, too much, maybe too much used to following up micro indicators, sector indicators and all that. And uh, I think that the, the starting point now is that we're going through what historians, maybe more than economists, call structural crisis. Structural crisis in the development of capitalism, you name it, but it's something that goes deeper and with very strong geopolitical implications. It's a war economy. We cannot avoid that. I mean, it's in the news every day. It's causing lots of different sectoral effects. But I think that what we need now is more of a geopolitical imagination. So in what way, we, sorry sorry to interrupt, but I just want to move this conversation forward because it's an excellent point. In what ways is this a, a, a um, historic crisis? Are you talking about the fact that the US dollar dominance and the Bretton Woods system created after the end of the Second World War is basically over and there needs to be a redistribution of the sort of global financial responsibility and system? Of course, this is not uh, like a boat in a blue sky. We know yeah. this has been maturing over the years. Uh, some people say that the debt crisis, the Latin American debt crisis, never actually went away right. because structural problems were not solved. One important structural problem is, as an effect of uh, neoliberal policies, the complete extinction of public expenditures and investment Absolutely. in capital formation. So this creates a structural barrier to short-term policies, be it fiscal, monetary, whatever. I mean, if you don't have a structured development plan, a view of the future, and that translates into capital formation. So just today, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has just released the latest data. It's shocking. It's shocking. The, the, the Latin American development state was destroyed along with lots of industrial bases. On the other hand, there is a new geopolitical scenario coming up. If you just look through, let's say, the trade balance in terms of trade of the Brazilian trade surplus, for instance, you see that there is a clear new structure emerging, not as globalized as before, not as internationalized, but of course, you can see a pattern that is connecting to Russia on the one hand and China on the other the strength of the agricultural sector. So let's keep it clear, in a crisis, not everyone gets hurt. And in Brazil, you can clearly see that's a new geopolitical alignment when we examine, for instance, the trade balance. Well, also, Brazil has been helped by rising commodity prices and obviously the grain crisis in Ukraine and Russia, you know, adds to that. And it, it has been a developing industry very much so. Uh, but, uh, you know, the problem is, is to make that sustainable for everyone, isn't it? And I really get your point. And I'd like to put this to John Tamley in a way, because, you know, uh, um, it wasn't so many years ago. We seem to be lurching from crisis to crisis in terms of the international system. And I thought what uh, Gilson said about the short termism, it, uh, you know, I think some people call it the Wall Streetization. Of, of development where everyone looks for instant profits uh, and uh, capitalizing on investments immediately rather than development. What needs to change? Or do you think that essentially the dominance of the sort of 
uh, Washington institutions won't change until they have to? Well, I think we overstate the short-termism of Wall Street. Uh, what was Amazon but Amazon.org for years and years, yet investors stuck by it through no profits. Silicon Valley, the most dynamic area of the U.S. economy, is defined by rampant failure. Uh, the investors in the United States are incredibly patient with companies that most often don't make it. That's the source of our dynamism, that we let bad ideas go. Uh, looking at it more broadly, though, I think the U.S. needs to play a major role in terms of currency reform. This won't be popular here, but the fact that the dollar has been so unstable for so long has global implications simply because the dollar is the world's currency. I don't think it's been helpful, the dollar's volatility in the 21st century, uh, with, with this in mind. And so it would be time for the U.S. Treasury to talk about currency st price stability that would enable uh, more of that around the world with, with more pegs to the dollars or, or implicit pegs and just less volatility in general related to currencies. That would mean reigning in a, a lot of Wall Street, though, wouldn't it, a little bit? The foreign, the foreign currency markets are, are trillion-dollar businesses. Um, you know, it would have effects on the bond market. What, what I'm trying to say here is that, essentially, the system seems to be almost incapable of reform because there's so much vested in it. Well, I think you'd be surprised. Let's never forget that Jamie Dimon, let's look at the biggest U.S. bank, when he took over at J.P. Morgan, he shut down their proprietary trading. You see, investors will not pay for short-term profits. Uh, they'll pay much more for investment banking profits. And so I think you'd be surprised if we return to some kind of more of a stable system, let's call it Louvre in 87 or something like that, you'd see a lot more investment in the creation of future wealth and much less facilitation of wealth creation through this rampant trading of currencies. It's up to $10 trillion a day. Um, I know it's probably odd to bring up uh, dead economists or political economists, but if David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and Adam Smith... I, 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 I studied them all, and they were inspirational, so I'm glad you did. Yeah, and, say, but, and they were brilliant. And what did, what did Adam Smith say, just kind of a throwaway line? The sole use of money is to circulate consumable goods. Money is supposed to be the quiet measure. Yet in modern times, it's been made the loud measure because of the volatility. And so I think that the U.S. Treasury, it's incumbent upon it to pursue dollar price stability. It would be great for Wall Street, and I would add great for the global economy. Yeah, he was also utilitarian and talked about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. It didn't just necessarily mean uh, those in the United States. We got heavy there. I, I want to just sort of um, uh, talk about the current crisis still uh, again. Let's go, let's go to London. Um, Klisman, um, energy prices, uh, they're going to announce in, in the UK soon a new cap. But, uh, I mean, essentially, people are preparing for up to £6,000. That's, uh, what, about $7,000 uh, more in payments per average household. Um, you're seeing it across. Germany is going to freak out as it, as it moves out of uh, uh, dependence on Russian uh, gas and oil. This is a real problem, isn't it? Because uh, essentially fuel inflation is one of the biggest things that consumers feel and stops them spending elsewhere. That's right. The summer of discontent is, is sort of a, a term that has been coined to, to reflect these mass uh, inflation uh, movements in not only the UK, but also in Europe. And you're right in saying that fuel inflation, energy inflation, is the backward, is the spine, is the beating heart of any economy. And when that goes up, all the derivatives of that also raise a uh, rise in price. And if, uh, okay. if, uh, if, 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 if incomes don't rise at the same rate, then that deficit is where the majority of pain will come for not only uh, individuals, but also for businesses. And this puts a spanner in the works of new businesses which are wanting to grow businesses which may need refinancing, uh, businesses which need to probably restructure now debts because of uh, because customers are coming through the door or online as regularly. So a lot of short-term thinking needs to, by necessity, needs to come into it to hedge against these uh, the, this inflationary environment. And it's certainly not a good uh, thing for anyone, especially with the politicians who now need to respond to this in ways which are, is hoped to fix the crisis as soon as possible. And the two leaders now, which are going head to head, are already trying to think of ways in which they can do that. Their policies, again, will be debated amongst the conservative uh, faithful to find who, who the new leader will be and what policies they'll put into place to, uh, to help curb this inflation, because the price rises that we're seeing are incredible. 
Um, the, the big ideas uh, are kind of being ignored, though. I understand when it's a leadership election for a, a right-wing or centre-right party that they would mention the N-word, nationalisation. But if you do look around Europe, prices can be controlled if you uh, nationalise certain parts of your energy industry. France, of course, has a nuclear industry that's very much tied to the state. Um, is that the way forward? Could, could you see Germans even, even getting involved with sort of nationalisation of, of power, some sort of European... Uh, uh, cooperation of this because it seems to me they uh, behold being beholden to the market is great in times of uh, plenty but it really does uh, create real problems in the short term when prices spike like this yeah well there's two things that can be said about that firstly um, you know the conservative way of life is one where l less interference in, in, in business affairs is best so nationalizing uh, um, sort of industries like this is against essentially their ethos and we haven't seen any calls for labor because they are not even in the running to to, to, to to be the ruling party so all they can say is what they would do if they were in power which is obviously you know they're painting the world to be you know paradise almost but uh, they're not in power to make these decisions and secondly by doing this there would be an expectation that things in the uk at least or anywhere in which this is done things will get better now, can the government promise that if we nationalize these things, if we bring prices under control, will this have any, any, any consequences which they haven't thought about moving into to the future? And this also doesn't take into consideration that a lot of these, uh, these uh, energy prices are not because the UK are doing it, but they're happening externally. So they're externalities okay. uh, to the UK. So they can't control what's happening in Russia. They can only hedge what they can within their own borders. Yeah, uh, John Gogh, I want to I bring you in here because uh, China, you know, obviously has a, a, a pretty well nationalised uh, energy industry. Um, but where is their focus on the next three to six months? It's a political season coming up. Uh, is the focus very much on the consumer, keeping consumer spending going, which had helped uh, at least in the first part of COVID drive uh, keep the economy uh, going? Is it on the wobbly housing sector? Is it on debt of uh, local governments, et cetera, et cetera? Where is the focus on Beijing right now? Um, well, I guess um, China doesn't face such a, uh, you know, a, a lack of uh, supply as has been seen in Europe. Uh, China still have access, still has access to uh, Russian oil and gas, still has access to... Uh, getting a discount we hear. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, it still has access to uh, Saudi oil, uh, Qatar uh, gas, uh, so we still have these things. And, and, and I would also argue that uh, um, the profit margin in the oil and gas industry, which is, you know, as you pointed out, pretty much monopolized by the state, uh, controlled by a few companies, uh, the profit margin, I think, is, is thick enough, is, 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 uh, is, is big enough to accommodate this kind of a supply shock. Um, the, you know, at the end of the day, if, if really oil prices uh, shoot up around the world, it's just a matter of, um, you know, the, the, the state companies making a few, you know, a little bit less of our money. Um, and, and the consumers in China are used to paying a lot more uh, oil price, I'm sorry, uh, gasoline prices, for example, compared to many parts of the world. So that's one thing. The second thing is I think China is rapidly, I'm really talking about rapidly uh, transitioning towards the new alternative energies. For example, China is investing very, very heavily in, in, in solar power, uh, in wind power, uh, these kind of technologies. Uh, because after all, these are the industries that are uh, seeing uh, you know, very strong Chinese companies presence, actually. So, um, uh, you know, the investment, the government's uh, incentivized investment in these uh, alternative energy uh, technologies are just moving on very rapidly. Um, let's uh, go to Gilson uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, Gilson, obviously this, um, the commodity uh, um, surge in prices has helped Brazil. It's also helped other Latin American countries as well. Um, but I saw in a recent report the, the um, predictions for growth really vary wi widely uh, amongst the Latin American economies. Colombia are expected to do very well. Chile is having a very good post-pandemic uh, uh, a rebound, but then we have sluggish growth in some of the biggest economies. I mean, obviously, we're talking about Argentina here. Um, so, why the discrepancy, and what's the way forward? Well, my view of the process of uh, economic development in Latin America uh, at least taught me that there's a difference between those countries that industrialized, that developed a minimal infrastructure 
for science, technology, research and development. And these countries, and Brazil is among them, Chile as well, Argentina is a special case, very, very complicated in terms of its political uh, framework. But anyway, you can see, you can clearly see that developed Latin America equals industrialized nations. Uh, all, even even the, the agro, agro sector is benefiting, has benefited over the years from lots of technological innovation, research and development and all that. So I think there is a, a clear difference here. On the other hand, I would like to bring us uh, a very important factor here, which is social unrest, social inequality, Good the point. degree of inequality that this crisis has brought about. I think for Latin America, in all countries, even in countries that more or less can benefit from commodity price increases like Brazil, but even here in Brazil, with its advantages in, 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 in different uh, perspectives, but in terms of the social order, in terms of expectations, right. political expectations, that has a cost. So is any government in Latin America ready to go on, go towards the future without a social policy? without keeping those uh, distribution policies that are mandatory. Otherwise, cities just will fall down. And if you don't have consumers, there's no development at all. So it I think that- I started to interrupt, sorry to interrupt. Oh, we're running out of time and I wanted to ask one last question to everyone and I want a sort of yes or no, well, A or B answer. And let's start with you, Gilson, because I interrupted. Do you think there's going to be a recession, deep recession, or recession in Latin America, or a soft landing? Cheese between the two. Soft landing. Okay, great. Let's go to. I'm cutting you off. Let's go to uh, uh, London and Clisman. Soft landing or recession in Europe? I think recession. And uh, obviously here in Bethesda, uh, John Tamney. You uh, neither. Economies grow. <laughs> I, I think that's a very good, honest answer. Uh, and uh, what do you think, John? Are you going to agree with uh, Mr. Tamley there? Um, I, I think it's, we're going to see a slowdown in China. Good, but you're not putting the R word in front of that. Uh, very wise. You never know. You might get called out on the other side. Uh, that's it for this edition. I really appreciate all the voices across the globe on this uh, and some very deep perspectives on economic thinking, which is uh, rare sometimes on a talk show, so I really appreciate it. That's all the time we, uh, it's all the, we have time for right now. I'm Nathan King in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon on The Hit. of business is to bring value. Business activities in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. reach consumers globally. Trade, manufacturing, energy, high-tech, real estate, consumption. We give an expanded view on global business and how it covers, influences, or relates to the whole world. Global Business, only on CGTN.